Who's glad to be here? We. Oui. You guys who are glad to be here sure are far away. If I knew you were going to sit back there, I'd have set up back there so we could have been more intimate. Would that, would that be easier on Wednesday nights to put up ropes? They do that at Legacy, don't they? At, at, uh, at Sagebrush and put up ropes to get everybody in kind of the same place. Oh, well. Everybody have a... Hey, guys. If you have a study guide, it'll be a little easier. I don't bring it for free. Oh. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't always cost. Five dollars? Okay. We're going to be in Ephesians 1 and 2. If you're using a blue Bible, it's page 1156, but uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, what, uh, what do you guys think about uh, Hurricane Harvey, huh? Awful, awful. Um, I understand the, the, earlier this afternoon uh, or early this morning, uh, sometime today, they found a, the 23rd body. I guess the, the water is finally receding and... Uh, yeah, uh, and of all the things that are going on, as, as awful as it is, um, uh, I find it interesting that the the media is focusing over uh, Melania's shoes. Of, of all the things that, uh, I guess that means I guess that means that the administration is doing a better job this time. I don't know what that means, but uh, uh, and what about Joel's? I found myself defending Joel. What the heck? Can you imagine me defending Joel? But uh, he was, uh, what? He was catching so much flack for not opening his church. Not a, his church is not a rescue shelter. It's, it's a church. It's not set up as a multi-purpose. It's set up as a, as a sanctuary, as a, as a church. But um, again, uh, and, and when, when he explains to people, it's, it's horrible that he was put in a position where he had to explain himself. Uh, but as he said, he wasn't, he wasn't asked. So then they jump on him and say, well, why did anybody have to ask? Well, because it's a church. It's not a, uh, he had been in contact with, with the authorities. He had been talking to the city. It had been used. He had never said no, uh, where he had said that, uh, I guess, uh, dealing with uh, people who were asking questions, uh, that the church uh, was flooded in some areas. And they said, no, see, it's not flooded. That's the way the media said, oh, see. They didn't say that. Uh, it's not flooded. Well, the pictures came out later. Yeah, parts of the church were flooded. That, but that's not the point. Um, the, uh, uh, the people of the city, the people of Houston, uh, my understanding, uh, learned some things from the Katrina episode. And it's difficult to protect and take care of people when there are so many in one place. They prefer people being in the smaller uh, shelters where there are only maybe a couple hundred rather than a few thousand uh, safety concerns. There were a lot of horrible things that happened during Katrina in the shelters. Yeah? Um, and he hadn't been asked, but uh, from the time, from the, time the, the, the rain started, people had been coming to the church for help, and he'd been helping. Uh, they, they, have, they have facilities. They have staff. They, they do help. They had been helping. They'd never said no. But uh, I think it's just pretty dirty. It, you know, shoot, I'm, you know me, man. I'm the first one to pile on. But uh, yeah, this was pretty dirty. It was just pretty dirty. They, they've been doing everything they can to, to help. Um, did God know about Harvey? Did God know that the hurricane was coming? Um, I, I remember Pat Robertson, one time Southern Baptist preacher, you know, praying that, uh, I don't remember which, which hurricane it was, that he prayed and it just skipped right around. But poor guys that it didn't skip around that, what, what yeah, what about them? Um, so what about that? Uh, did, did God make it happen? Did God take a nap and Satan sent it? Or uh, is this one of those, the rain falls on the just and the unjust? Yeah? Is that just because you're a bunch of Baptists? Don't you have enough faith to believe that uh, God could have? So, okay, hurricanes coming to Albuquerque. We're not going to get a hurricane, right? We're a little, little too desert for hurricanes, but some storm is about to happen. Uh, what do you pray? God, don't let it happen? Uh, is it okay to pray like that? Uh, if we're having, we're in the middle of monsoon, huh? I guess. Uh, huh? We thank him for the rains. You always hear people that we needed the rain. We needed the rain. That's easy to say. We uh, had just uh, bought a house. Uh, we had just gotten married, I guess, right? 
we bought the, the, the Seco house, and we were re-roofing. And we just, <laughs> we just, you know, you take off the old roof to put on the new roof, and the rains came, <laughs> and they came, and they came. And I remember walking in the house, and it was just pouring inside. It was beautiful, but it was just <laughs> pouring inside. Now, you know, I guess I could have paid better attention to the weather, I guess, but I never believe what they say. Um, what, what, do you, what do you pray when the rains are coming and, you know, you still got a leak that needs to be, do you pray, God, make it go away? Or, you know, Lord, I guess the farmers need it, so can you let it rain just not over my house? Or, Lord, help me fix my roof faster? Or do you just, you know, my, my, my prayer life is, there are a lot of areas in my spiritual life where I'm like a little baby, you know, very sweet, but kind of stupid. My prayer life is just kind of, I don't know. I would tell you that's, one of, that's not one of the strong areas of my life. I pray all the time. I pray without ceasing, I would think, but that doesn't mean I go around babbling all the time. It means I'm in a constant attitude of, you know, God, you know. But is it okay to, to go on the offensive? What do, what do you pray in a Harvey situation? What do you pray now? Do you pray for God's visitation in the United States? Things that we don't yeah. know. Yeah. So you're still just trusting him. You're reaching out to him, God, help a brother out, but yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Pray for their safety. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to know what to pray. Uh, you see guys on Facebook, um, you know, concerned about my Houston friends. Uh, let me know what I can pray. And I'm not very spiritual and I'm not very nice. My, my first thoughts are generally, why did you post that? You know, just pray. What, what, what kind of a thing is that? You know, hey, I'm, so, I'm, I'm not very nice, right? So I think, well, what can I pray for you? You know, I'm, I'm just not very nice like that. Um, if you don't know what to pray, you know, I, I guess if you really have Houston friends, talk to them, yeah. you know. Praying here. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You don't see Facebook. Praying here. I don't know if you're doing that. That's okay. But I'm saying that, <laughs> I'm saying that we, we, we want to be careful. Uh, we want to be careful about whether our, 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 uh, our uh, we don't want to be too proud of our humility. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't want to be too ostentatious about our spirituality. If we're growing in the faith, Yay, God, you know, you're, you're trusting him. And if something bad's about to happen, uh, my goodness, you, yeah, you pray. Do I pray to get out of the mess? Of course. But God knows. He knew about the hurricane coming, and, and he knew who would be spared, and he knew who would be hurt. And I don't know. You know, the ones who got hurt, of course, they must be bigger sinners than the ones who didn't get hurt. No, but that's what Job's friends said. You know, but that's not the way it works. I don't know how it works. I just know that we're living in a sin-cursed world, and I know you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner, and we're surrounded by sinners, and all of creation is waiting on tippy-toe for the redemption, Paul says. I paraphrased a little bit. But all of creation is waiting for the redemption. I mean, it's, it's messed up. You live in a messed up place. Um, Uncle Bill, uh, the other night we were, you know, he, he, he loved, to, he got kind of sick here. So be praying for Uncle Bill, but he got uh, kind of sick, but he, he moved out here to the Southwest so he could be a couple of thousand miles, what, 1,500 miles closer to the Grand Canyon and, and Yosemite and places like that because he lived in Maine and he moved out here. Well, he may not be able to do a lot of those things. So we were watching uh, uh, YouTube videos, we were watching Yosemite. We were, I mean, looking at hikes and trails, and which is my kind of hiking, you know? I don't have to drive to the Grand Canyon. All I had to do is this Grand Canyon, four minute, short, you know. And it was cool, man. We're going up, we're going down, and we're in the valleys, with, you know, the clouds and the storms, and ooh, that's the three sisters, and ooh, I don't know, I'm making up stuff. Well, I, I love that kind of stuff. I, I love it. I don't even remember why I started to tell the story. Oh, that's why I told him, because I'm so cool. No, that's not why. Yeah. 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 
Well, I don't remember exactly why I started to tell the story. Yeah, I'm awesome. Wait, I couldn't hear you. Oh. It'll, it'll, it'll come to me. Uh, but again, God knows. God knows. You know, and, and, and poor guy. Poor guy. Um, when, when something bad is going to happen, I think it's okay to pray. Absolutely. It's okay. When something bad happens, it doesn't mean that you did something horrible. I think it's always good to be sensitive. God, is this storm the result of stupidity? Is this storm the result of sin? Is this storm the result of... Who knows? Uh, the, the point... Is, uh, I'm not very spiritual. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm pretty... I wish I could say childlike. I'm more childish in my prayer life. But um, generally, my prayer for people in a situation... Uh, I, I, it, it's, it's, people are generally pretty disappointed when they finally break down. They have to be pretty messed up to come and ask me, hey, could you pray about? Because they know that generally if I pray, it may work backwards, you know. Um, but I generally, inside, inside, when I'm by myself, God, you know, bring them closer. Uh, do I pray for healing? Well, yeah. Do, do I pray to fix it? Well, yeah. Do I pray that it'll feel better, get better? Well, yeah. But God knows. And so generally my prayer is God, the people in the situation, God, please bring them closer to you. If, if, if they need to be saved, then, then Jesus, please, you know, reach them now. If they, if they know the Lord, but, but, you know, they're not very grown in their faith, well, they need to come closer. They need to come closer. So generally that's the way I pray for Houston, and that's the way I pray for you, and that's the way I pray for me, and, uh, you know, for, for Uncle Bill, and, and, and for Lauren's dad, and, and for dad, and, and for you, and for you, and for me, that's generally what I pray. What's the purpose of the storm? I don't know. Correction? Maybe. Perfection? Always. The purpose of the storm is always that you either come to Jesus or become more like Jesus. Always. Why would Jesus send the disciples into the middle of a storm on the Sea of Galilee? Because he hated their guts. Because they sinned. Because they messed up. No. That was just, just part of it. So I don't know. I, I don't know. We struggle. Uh, the, the, that 16-year-old shooter in Clovis. Little, little church kid. Uh, killed two, I think, and four were shot. I, I, I don't know if they're going to be okay. I, I hadn't heard today. But um, w what is that about? Is it supposed to be the magic thing? You know, you, you raise your kids in the Lord, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from... Boy, that'd be nice if that was a blank check, but it's not. That, that train up a child, that's, it's basically, a, you know, here's a great principle, and if it turns out great, glory, you know, thank you, God. If it turns out real bad, God, I still praise you. Uh, the kid had a, a uh, I think it was his, uh, his, his pastor's, I guess the associate pastor, I don't remember what her name is. I don't know if it was a pastor's wife, but a lady associate pastor from the church that he's attending. And his girlfriend uh, both had been talking to the media and said that, you know, he had been estranged from his biological mother, and that's really torn him up. And at one point, he had taken a knife and, you know, run it up and down his chest like he was considering suicide but didn't. Um, started going to this church maybe four months ago, just, just recently. I uh, was baptized about three months ago. And again, you know me. I, I think it's good to get baptized, but you're just getting wet, man, if you haven't given your life to Jesus. I'm not saying he hasn't. I'm just saying there's nothing magic about the waters of baptism. It barely gets you wet. You're not in long enough, you know, let alone get you sinless. And, but uh, he had started going to the church about four months ago, uh, had been struggling with stuff. Uh, I don't know what kind of, you know, commitment he'd made to Christ, but was baptized about three months ago. Um, just, uh, I think, recently, maybe a month ago, shared a half-hour testimony in church. Uh, there are reasons that I don't, you know, anybody have a word from the Lord? Just keep it to yourself. If he talked to you, I don't want to know. If he spoke to you, great. But, you know, testimonies, you know, you know my position, they can be incredibly persuasive, but they don't prove anything. This guy had a great, you know, half-hour testimony and, and is basically sharing his, his heart. Well, there's a place for that. I don't know that a church service is, but they were kind of, you know, let it out, brother. Let it out. And so we just kept on. Um, I think he was suspended, uh, some bullying situation at school. Don't raise your hand. Is there any, anybody here who was not bullied in school? Except Gary. Are there any bullies present? Gary. <laughs> 
the same guy, the same guys raised their hands, right? Who wasn't bullied? Who wasn't made fun of? Who we didn't deal with it that way. You know, we cry, we tattle, you know, we find out who to hang out with or something, but so he'd been bullied Friday. I think he was suspended the same day, probably for the same kinds of things. And then the shooting was Monday, right? Uh, but he was in church Sunday night and, you know, singing this little light of mine. And what does Jeremiah say about trust in your heart? You know, just follow your heart. Our heart is desperately wicked. You have no idea what you could do if you thought you could do it and get away with it. You have no idea how violent you can be. You have no idea how messed up you could be. Well, not you, but Christians. We, we, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you. You have no idea. We have no idea. Our hearts are desperately wicked. And, and, and the point the, the, of coming to salvation, that's the beginning. This whole thing we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, this idea of sanctification, this idea of being set apart for God, that starts a process of becoming more like Christ. You come to Christ, that's justification. Eventually you go to be with Christ, that's glorification. Everything in between your justification and glorification is sanctification. And you've got lots of room to mess up in there. Lots of room. You shouldn't, but you got lots of room. So when we mess up, what do we do? Well, repent, get right with God and fix it, yeah? If you're perfect like me, good for you. <laughs> but we're not there yet, huh? Um, how do you pray for a kid like that? Try him as an adult. Fry him. No? Hang him. And give him mercy and, and, and forgive him. And Wow. How do, you, how do you feel when you hear people say, well, he's just a kid, he doesn't know, he's troubled, you know, cut him some slack, forgive him? Everybody's got something, right? Yeah. I killed my wife because she's an alcoholic. I killed my wife because I'm an alcoholic. I, you know. Yeah, I killed my wife because she's mean to me. I killed my wife because I'm mean, I don't know. I mean, what? I, I'm kind of on a thing here, huh? Have you noticed that? Uh, why? <laughs> yeah, I'll get off that one. <laughs> Why do we do what we do? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and then you come to Jesus and you still sin. Stop it. Stop it. Wow. So do we pray for the kid? Yeah. Do we pray for the two ladies who died? No, they're Now, in Catholic Church, we were taught to pray for them. You have to pray rosaries and everything, yeah. But by then, if, yeah, to pray about a purgatory. If the Bible's true, of course I believe it is, when a person leaves this place, they immediately go to be with Jesus if they're saved, or they immediately are separated from God if they're not. There's no in-between. You don't pull a number like at Baskin Robbins or, heaven forbid, the Department of Motor Vehicles. It's not like that at all. You die, you're immediately with Jesus or immediately separated. So praying for the two who passed away, no. Praying for their families, yeah. Praying for the kid, absolutely. Uh, praying for the administrator, you pray, pray for everybody. What's the prayer? I don't know. Uh, again, I'm pretty childish, childlike in my prayer life. I generally default to, Jesus, please bring them closer to you. Boy, if they need to get saved, please save them. And, and, if, they, and if they know you, help them grow. Because saints, that's you if you've given your life to the Lord, Saints are stupid. How could we do some of the things we do? How could we possibly let ourselves get away with some of this stuff? I don't know, but it makes sense when we're doing it. Doesn't it? It makes perfect sense. We're messed up. Our hearts are wicked. Our hearts are warped. Our hearts are twisted. When we come to Jesus Christ, that's the beginning of it all. So... I'm going to draw you a little picture, then we're going to get into it. We're, we're going to go pretty fast. Okay, saints get sanctification from God. That, that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, and that's right at the beginning of your study guide. Saints get sanctification from God. It doesn't sound grammatically correct, but just bear with me here. It's okay. Sinners get separation from God. Saints, that's you if you've given your life to Jesus Christ. We're not talking about somebody in the Catholic Church that gets canonized. We're talking about somebody who recognizes they're a sinner. Jesus is God. He died for their sins. was buried, rose from the dead, and they make an unconditional surrender to Jesus Christ. They become a saint. Saints get sanctification. 
We're, we're going to talk more about what that is. But basically, it, it, it's being set apart by God, set apart for God, set apart with God, okay? Saints get sanctification. Sinners, we're all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've come to Jesus. You're still a sinner. But this is what the Bible refers to as people who have not come to Jesus Christ. People who may be religious, but they don't have that relationship with God. Sinners get separated from God. That's what, that's what they get from God. They get separation from God, okay? All right, look up here at me. Here's, a, here's a, an area, okay? Now my, you're going to be the Lord, babe, okay? I'm trying to get out of that mess about killing my wife thing. Okay, anyway, the Lord's in that direction. She's not the Lord, but the Lord's in that direction, okay? Here I am. Uh, 70, 18-year-old kid, the fall of 1973, I finally say, I give up, Jesus. I don't understand all this religious stuff. Um, I, I, I'm already a Catholic. I sure don't want to be a Baptist. I really don't want to be like my friend Carl. But it seems like everything he's telling me is from the Bible, and I need to give my life to you. I, I want to give my life to you. So in the fall of 1973, I say uncle. You know, I, 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 I go forward. It was almost like a Billy Graham crusade. It's at Berean Baptist Church. The preacher preached. They took the offering. They sang the songs. I sat there all uncomfortable. We all stood up for the invitation. I grabbed the pew because I wasn't going to let him make me do anything. And then on the 438th verse of Just As I Am, I finally stepped out in the aisle. I went forward. An altar worker took me aside took me through the Bible to make sure I understood I was a sinner, that Jesus was God, he died for my sins, was raised, rose from the dead. Would you like to pray to give your life to the Lord? <laughs> or something like that. You want to just pray, or you want me to pray, and you just say what I say? And I, <laughs> So he prayed, and, and I prayed. Uh, Jim Carter was his name, like the president. Remember Jim Carter, Dad? Jim Carter was the altar worker, and, and, and he prayed, and I prayed. And he prayed a little bit, and I prayed a little bit. He talked to God, talked to God. And when it was all over... Uh, I didn't feel any different. You know, I still felt embarrassed because the, 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 the altar call, you know, was in front of God and everybody. There were 1,400 people there. It was the first time I'd ever been in anything that wasn't a Catholic church. And they didn't take us off to the side in a counseling room, a prayer room, you know, like at Calvary or, or they're starting to do it sagebrush, you know, we've got offices. And it was right there in front of everybody. I'm kneeling there. And, and so when it was over, there were 20 of us standing up there. 20 of us had come forward to give our lives to the Lord that morning at uh, October, I think, of 1973, one particular Sunday. And uh, the pastor says, these people have come to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've given their lives to the Lord. You folks come up and give them the right hand to Christian fellowship. I didn't know what that was, but I was ready for it. And so they came around. They just you know, shook our hand, gave us a hug, and said, hey, we're, we're praying for you. And... and uh, that began, I actually, I probably gave my life to Jesus before that morning, but I didn't have any kind of assurance of salvation. I had prayed the prayer probably a hundred times before that Sunday morning. I've prayed the prayer probably 10,000 times since then. You only have to be born again once. You only have to get saved once, but that's, that's too important. That's too big to, yeah, I think I did. You know, I've done some stupid things since then. How could, how could, a, how could a, a guy who loves the Lord be that stupid? So maybe I'm not saved. So I'll pray the prayer again, you know. And, and sometimes, I'm, you know, maybe I didn't do anything stupid. I just get kind of spiritually sensitive, and maybe I haven't given my life to the Lord yet. So I, I pray. And, but at some point, I give my life to Jesus Christ, okay? Here I am, and I'm going toward the Lord. I'm still alive. I didn't get saved and die. I got saved, and I'm, here I go. There's a pretty big path. It's a God path. And I'm on my way to God. What we're going to be looking at, again, over the next couple of weeks, we started a couple of weeks ago, and then over the next couple of weeks, this sanctification process, it's passive and active. God is doing it to you. So you're passive in this thing. And it's active. God's doing it, but you're doing it. If you're not cooperating, that's indicative of this uh, proposition that maybe you didn't get saved. If you're not working with him, to sanctify yourself, you may not be saved. But if you're saved, he's sanctifying you. So he's doing it to you, and you're cooperating with him, okay, up here. So here's this path. 
the Bible says that from the time I give my life to Jesus Christ, I am on this pathway, this God path, and I will get to God, and I will be perfect as a, as a, as a chaste bride before the Lord, before my bridegroom. Am I that now? You don't have to ask Laura. No, I'm not. I'm not that good. No. How am I going to be that clean? How am I going to be that perfect? How am I going to be that spotless and blameless when I go to be with the Lord? That's what sanctification is. Thank you, God. Thank you. Justification is when I gave my life to Jesus. When I go to be with Jesus, at that moment, that's glorification. Everything in between is my sanctification. It's, there's two parts to that. God's doing it to me, and I'm cooperating with him. This God path, God's making me that blameless, chaste virgin. He's making me that, that, that spotless, holy. I'm going there. That's a pathway. Okay, in between the two sides of that path is the course that I'm on. We, we often talk about God's will as, as two banks of a river. And I have the freedom to go over the banks. I shouldn't. I have the freedom and the power in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, to go straight to God. I don't have to pass go. I don't have to sin. I don't have to be stupid. I will sin and I will be stupid. But the Bible says in Christ, through the Spirit, I don't have to sin anymore. That makes it worse. That means when I sin, it's because I want to. Now, there's, a, there's still a, 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 a sin, there's still a law of sin, the Apostle Paul says, at work in me. But I also find a, a law of, of Christ that, that's, that's, that's working. And, you know, you got two dogs in the fight. Which one's going to win? Well, the one I feed. The dog what I feed is going to win. So if I feed the spirit and if I feed the flesh, guess what's going to win? All right. So here's this God path. Sanctification is what God will do for me. Thank you, God. But inside that path is me. Me making decisions. Good decisions. Godly decisions. Gross decisions. Stupid decisions. Spiritual decisions. Sensitive decisions. I have the choice in here to stay right in the center of God's will, right in the center of God's path, or to be stupid. Guess what we usually do? <laughs> but the more I stay right where he wants me, the more I'm cooperating with what he's doing in my life. And that's what I want for you. I want a healthy church. In a healthy church, there will be no sin. Psh, of course you're going to have sin. In a healthy church, will you have unbelievers? Yes. Because you're going to be reaching people. You're going to be inviting people. You're going to be saying, I, I, this is what I want for my friends. This is what I want for my family. I want them to hear this. I want them to know this. Are you going to have unbelievers in a church, in a healthy church? Yeah. Are you going to have sin? Yes. Are you going to have people doing stupid things? Yes. Are you going to have people doing good, godly things? Yes. In a healthy body of believers, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. Yeah. I mean, a ministry. It's a mess. It's a mess. And, 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 and in a healthy church, it seems to me that you want to you wanna do everything you possibly can to be on this, uh, I'm going to change my analogy here, okay? You kind of a tipping point thing. You, you want to do everything you can to make sure that there are more of us who are on the good godly side than those who are on the I couldn't care less about what you think I'm supposed to do in my life. You, pastor, or you, Christians, or you, God. Those are the guys who need Jesus. You want to reach them. If you have more people who couldn't care, maybe they're saved, but they're living for themselves and they're not living for him. If at that tipping point, you've got more on the, I'm going to do my thing, rather than God, I can't, but I so want to do your thing. Understanding what sanctification is, I mean, if it was all just God, great, man, just eat, drink, and be merry. But Jesus said to the people, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Do, do whatever you want because tomorrow you die. Those are the people, uh, for, for as much credit as I'm giving Joel now, you know, your best life now, only if you're on your way to hell. Really, I know what he meant. But if this is the best, wow, they're going to miss heaven. But if you're on your way to heaven... This ain't so good. 
bad grammar, good theology. This life is going to be a mess. It's going to be miserable sometimes. It, it is going to be amazingly wonderful sometimes. So, sanctification looks like this. See this God path? You need to give your life to Jesus. At some point, you, you got to be saved. You got to be born again. That's justification. You want to make sure you've done that. Oh, you want to make sure you've done that. And then when you go to be with Jesus, at the point of death, or rapture, but at the point of death, that's glorification. Everything in between, come on, guys. Quit sinning. Start serving. Quit doing what you want. Do more of what God wants. Because we want to be on that, changing that analogy and that tipping point. To have a healthy church, it's going to be full of crazy people. It's going to be full of sinners. It's going to be full of people who are doing good things. Full of people who are doing... Which one did I say already? Good, bad. You're going to have both. But we want to be on the side that we've got more people who can lead them to Jesus and help them become more like Jesus than people who are saying, oh, yeah, I've given my life to Jesus, and I'll show up whenever the heck I feel like it. I'll give when I want. I'll do what I want. It's just hard. It's hard, it's hard to, to, to raise a family of believers when a whole bunch are saying, you know, I'm going to kind of do my thing. When everything in the Bible says, no, we want to do God's thing. So, so you kind of with me? Does that kind of make sense? Any questions? Did that sound a little harsh? I can make it harsher, but it's not harsh enough. I, I do want to make it black and white. Okay, so saints get sanctification. That's this one. That's the God path. That, he's doing that to you. In here, that's what you're doing for him. Okay? That's sanctification. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. We're going to be in Ephesians. But 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Gee, what does God want for my life? Hmm, that I be sanctified. Remember over the last couple of weeks, uh, sanctification. It's uh, agiosmos. It's, uh, 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 it's uh, uh, agios. It's uh, santo. Yeah, in the Greek. Spanish, right? It, it means to be holy. It means to be a saint. And it literally means to be set apart for a purpose. So this cup, I could use it for paint thinner, but it's supposed to be for a cup. So encourage each other, build each other up, just as you were already doing. I don't know whose cup this is. I know you, where your cup is. I used it and I took it home. Is that the one that's from the Golden West Casino or something? All, I know. How are you supposed to drink coffee when all the, all the good cups are at the house because I forget to bring them back? This was made for coffee or tea. I can put whatever I want in it, but it's been sanctified. It's been made for a specific purpose. Uh, I was teasing Uncle Bill the other day because we went to Freddy's, you know, the hamburger place with all the fries. Mm -mm, mm -mm -mm. And he had a, a cup that was not for hot coffee. And he just liked it. He just kept using it. Well, he was putting coffee in it and put it in the microwave. Well, if you know Lauren, you're not supposed to put any plastic in the microwave. So I just do it just a bugger. I'll go look for a styrofoam something just to stick it in there. Just to, No, I'm not that bad. But I was kind of teasing him. That cup was sanctified, set apart for cold beverages. Does that make sense? Styrofoam is set apart, sanctified for cold or hot beverages. I know it doesn't sound very spiritual, but that's what sanctification means. Sanctification means something has been set apart for a specific purpose. All right? And it's God's will that you be set apart for a specific purpose. Ephesians 4.18 Unbelievers, uh, Gentiles is what it says in the passage, but unbelievers are darkened in their understanding and they're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. The Bible says that unbelievers are blinded by Satan. The Bible says that unbelievers are blind by their sinful nature. I mean, they, they're unable. Uh, the Apostle Paul says dead, unresponsive, unable to respond to the things of God. It's only by the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, that's a King James word, it's only by the making alive power of the Holy Spirit that you can even understand that you're a sinner and need to come to Christ. But when God chooses, and I don't know why, but he doesn't choose everybody. I don't understand that. But it looks like those who are saved are among the elect. I know. <laughs> who woke him up? The elect, I, I, don't, I don't understand it, but it looks like the Bible teaches that the elect are those that... God, what did Jesus say? You can't come to God unless God himself draw you, woo you. You're wooed. That's a, that's a word we use today, huh? wooed. We're wooed by the Holy Spirit. We're, 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 we're not seduced by the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're drawn. 
encouraged, invited by the Holy Spirit. You can say no. But you can't, you don't have the, the, the spiritual awareness to say yes or no unless he picks you to say yes or no. That's kind of a weird thing. And that's, that's a whole other series of messages. But the Bible says unbelievers are darkened in their understanding. And because they're darkened in their understanding and unsaved, they're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance. Not ignorance like stupidity, but ignorance like I, they just don't have that knowledge. They don't have that can is the word, that, that body of knowledge inside their heart, inside their head. They, they don't have that because of the hardening of their hearts. So did God make Pharaoh hard or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? Yes. The Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? That one's actually easy, the chicken. Yeah, the chicken came first. But what came first, God hardened Pharaoh's heart or Pharaoh hardened his own heart? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Just don't harden yours. If you know what the Bible says, if the Bible says do this and you're doing this, which side of the tipping point would I want you to be on? Do what he wants. Not the, I'm already saved, I can get away with it, I don't have to do that. Don't, don't be there. It, it, it's a dangerous place to know God's word and to know God's will and to not do it. it it's like a guy who builds his house on the sand, the Bible says. It, it's a dangerous place to be. So saints get sanctification from God. Sinners get separation from God. You were selected by God. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Ephesians 1 starting in verse 1. Uh, Paul, from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Remember the New Testament books, by and large, are letters that the apostle Paul wrote to churches. This one says it's written to the Ephesians, but there's a possibility that, well, the Ephesians church got it, the church at Ephesus got it. It looks like maybe it was more a circular letter that was supposed to go to the churches in Asia Minor, kind of like the churches in Revelation. So it probably went to more than just the church at Ephesus. But, okay, uh, from Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God written to the saints in Ephesus, uh, written to the saints is literally what it says, uh, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, I, I'm, I'm hoping you have a grace-filled life and a peace-filled life. That was in a letter like, hey, see you guys, have a good day. It's not like because you say, have a good day, that God goes, who the heck is he to tell me that I have to give that guy a good day? Angels, go give that guy a good day. Tony said, have a good day, so I got to do it. When Paul says grace and peace, he's saying, hey, have a good day. Hope you have a grace-filled life. Hope you, except they put their, their uh, that, that we usually put at the end of the letter or the end of the conversation, they would put at the beginning, all right? Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, because he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy, and to be blameless in his sights. Stop there. <coughs> that didn't help. I covered it so I wouldn't be as loud. I'll just cough in it <coughs> a little bit. You were selected by God. The Bible says you were sanctified. You were selected. You were chosen in him, verse 4 says. It's all the same thing. You were picked, okay? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, again, this is in, in your study notes, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. That sanctifying work, it, it, it starts before you get justified. That sanctifying work, God was drawing you to himself before you got saved, and, and you couldn't understand you needed to be saved without the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and you couldn't have been saved without the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and you can't move toward God without the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and you sure can't move into the presence of God without the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, there's a God path that God does to you. Part of the indication that you're born again, a marker that you're truly saved, is that you personally struggle in your personal life to stay within the boundaries of sanctification as you find in the Bible. He tells you what he wants you to be. Be ye holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Who can be holy and perfect? Christ. But 
through him, the Bible says through Christ, and by the Holy Spirit, you have the options. So when you, when you succumb to the flesh and you do what you want, when you do what you think is best, when you do, when you do what you believe is yours, you're going to get yours. Yeah, you're going to get yours. When you yield and not succumb to the flesh, but you submit to the Holy Spirit, when you struggle against the flesh, this law of sin and this law of grace, you've got Jesus Christ and you. How stupid for me to say, I want me to win. But how often I do. How often we do. Because it makes sense. That's why God wants us to follow what the Bible says instead of following our heart. You follow your heart, you're going to get messed up. You're going to get messed up. So you've been chosen by God. Okay, we're going we're gonna to fly through uh, Ephesians uh, 1 and, and 2 here because we, we kind of have that foundation for it. You were selected by God, and he wants you to be in him. You see that, number one? You were selected by God, number two, and he wants you to be what? Like him. And then number three, you were selected by God, and he wants you to be with him. Okay, that's what we're going to see here. So uh, chapter 1, uh, yeah, starting about verse 4, right where you were, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he uh, predestined us god predestined us uh, to be adopted as his sons and daughters through jesus christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will not for you you know god loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life that sounds good but he didn't pick you for you he didn't save you for you he picked you for him and he saved you for him. It's all to God's glory is the idea. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, and God made known to us the mystery of his own will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times uh, will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He says that a bunch, his will, his will, it's his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. 13, and you also, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit, 14, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the first point, you were selected by God and he wants you to be what? In him. You were selected by God and he wants you to be in him. Look back at that chapter. Look at verse uh, 1. To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ. Look at verse 3. Uh, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Um, down to verse uh, 6, uh, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through the blood of Christ. Verse 9, um, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. Verse 12, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. You were sealed in him. What uh, verse am I in? Uh, the end of verse 13? What's that? 13, 13 yeah. Uh, in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with the seal, uh, the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, so all over the place, he talks about this idea that, that we're in him. Well, all of this is according to his will, the Bible says. It was according to his purpose. It was his purpose that you be, hmm, what? In him. Well, that means saved, to be in him, to be in Christ. Jesus said, you're in my hand. My hand is in the hand of the Father. No man can pluck you out. Right? The Bible says that you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. You were sealed in Christ. You were sealed in the Spirit. Literally, a seal was 
I write a letter and I roll it up in parchment in the olden days. Now I write a letter like that. But now I roll it up and to seal it, they would take candle wax and they would melt it. There were certain kinds of wax that were, could be used for that. But they would take a soft wax and they'd pour it on the, on the edge, right? They'd, they'd pour it on the edge. And then they would take their signature ring, their signet ring, if, if they weren't a governor or a president or a king, you know, some, some fancy schmancy guy, then they would just have a regular seal that was used. So the wax was poured on the seam, and then the signet ring, or the signature, the signet ring, or the stamp, was pressed in. That stamp, that seal, did a couple of things. It, it, it was to prove authenticity. Uh, this is mine. It has my T-Rex in it. King T. Uh, right there. It says right there. So that means it's for me. It was to keep it for the right person. It was to keep it sealed. Uh, the, the seal had a lot of uh, uh, very important reasons. The Bible says that you were sealed. The Bible says he's, he's written his epistle on your hearts. You're, you're a letter from God. You're a, you're a child of God. You're a, a, a product because of God's will. And, and you belong to him, and he's protecting, preserving you for himself. You've been sealed. Um, I don't think I'm doing the the idea uh, in injustice to continue the uh, picture that I've always used, to be sealed in the Holy Spirit is that. It's, that that's the idea, that the seal in the seal, right? But literally what it means, when, when you look at all the passages of Scripture, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it's like He put you in a spiritual baggie, that triple Ziploc, and He sealed you in there with a spaghetti sauce, and he'd turn it upside down. You're in his hand, and his hand is in the hand of the Father, and no man can pluck you out, and none of your spaghetti sauce is going to drip out. That literally, it means the seal. But the idea is that you're in Christ. You're in him. You're in that spiritual baggie, and no man can pluck you out. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at, at Romans 8, uh, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And you look at the rest of the passage, and it's almost as though the Apostle Paul is, is anticipating the arguments. Yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what if? Have you ever, have you ever heard people uh, use the argument, you know, that free will nonsense? Which, by the way, free will is self-will, and self-will is sin. So get over your bad self when you're out. I've got free will. Yeah, if you want to sin. Oh, I tried to get to that one breath, and I couldn't. <laughs> now I don't remember what I was going to say. Free will, self-will. Yes, 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 yes. Jesus said, you're in my hand. My hand is in the hand of the Father. No man can pluck you out. Yeah, but I could jump out. How many people have I heard say that? Now, obviously, these are going to be people who, 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 don't, who don't subscribe to the one saved, always saved. Well, you Baptists, you believe the one saved, always saved. Well, I don't believe that because I'm a Baptist. I believe it because it's in the Bible. The Bible says that when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, what did I get? Temporary salvation. Eternal salvation. What kind of security do I have? For a little while. No, it's eternal security. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have for a little bit. No. Eternal life. Jesus Christ died on the cross to give you everlasting life. Forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he shall reign. And he shall reign for. I don't know how it goes. It's eternal life. It's everlasting. You're in my hand, Jesus said, and my hand is in the hand of the Father. No man can pluck you out, but I could jump out. No, you can't jump out. So in Romans 8, 28 and following, it's almost as though Paul is, 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 is addressing those arguments. Well, what could take you out of salvation? And he lists a whole bunch of things. None of those things. Well, who could take me out of salvation? Uh, nobody. And at the end, it, if there's anything that you could possibly think of, nothing, no one, nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing can because you're in that spiritual baggie. He chose you. And part of that choosing is that you are in him and that you will eventually be with him. That was his purpose. 
That was his purpose. If it was my purpose, I could change my mind. And I would. If anybody could, I, you know, I would. But I don't belong to me. Peter says I was bought with a price. Paul says I was bought with a price. I don't belong to me. In fact, I, you know, we kind of soften it. We say, you know, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. The words are literally doulos. That means slave. But, in, you know, we're so sensitive about, you know, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Literally, it meant when you come to Christ, you're a slave. A slave. Like, you don't belong to yourself. A servant, he can quit. A servant can say, no, I don't want to do that. A slave doesn't have that choice. The Bible says that when you actually come to Christ, you are a doulos, a slave. That's why a lot of people, I think, well, I worry about them. I worry about them because they act like they still have choices. And we do. We make stupid choices. Glor justification happened when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Glorification is when I actually go to be with Christ. Sanctification is something the Holy Spirit is doing. If I can do, you've never heard this. If I can do bad and not feel bad, that's very bad. Why? Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is, 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 is nudging me and, and poking me with his elbow and flicking me on the ear and pinching me on the back of the knee or whatever the Holy Spirit does to convict me. I should be a spiritual grown-up enough to know when I'm being stupid or sinful. But sometimes, you know, boys will be boys. No, they're sinners. And it just made sense. You don't know what she did to me. You don't know what he did to me. It doesn't matter. I know what he did for you. But man, it's tough. It's tough to, in between what God's going to do for me, in me, through me, it's tough for me to struggle. Why would I have to struggle? Because I want to do my will. But in me, I want to do his will. I see the struggle. Which dog is going to win? The one what you feed. Don't feed the flesh. Be the Spirit. So he wants us to be in him. That means saved. Two, he wants us to be, what does it say? Like him. Verse 4. Uh, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3, verse 4. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be, what does yours say? Blameless. Holy and blameless. A la modi. Fortunately, those are English words, and they were translated from Greek words. Whew. In the Greek, you know what it means? holy and blameless. Oh, no. It means perfect. God intends for you to be perfect. God intends for you to be blameless. He intends for you to be spotless. How am I going to do that? I'm glad you asked that question. That's what the whole Bible's for, to tell you what, what to do and, and how to do it. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, mine's on the same page, just a little lower. Ephesians 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead, unresponsive, unable to respond to the things of God. You were dead in your sins, in your transgress in transgressions and sins. Verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We don't want to be that group. We don't want to be like them. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time. Well, how could you tell that I lived among them? Because that was a group that was gratifying the cravings of their own sinful nature. And they were following its desires and thoughts. So they were doing what who wanted? Whatever they wanted and what the devil wanted. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. These people are under the wrath of God. They will suffer hell. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That means that he made it so that we could respond to him, where before we couldn't. It is by grace that you've been saved. You didn't get saved because you figured it out and you pulled yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps. It was a gift. It's a free gift from God. Six, God raised us up with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's past tense. Look around you. Does this look like heaven to you? No. Does it feel like heaven? No. Look up here. That's part of this. God declares you righteous. He declares you holy. He declares you blameless. He declares you perfect. But inside God's path, the, the God path, inside of that, it's you deciding whether you want to cooperate with him or fight against him. Knock yourself out, you're going to lose. This God path includes people who are going to stand before him in judgment too. 
We don't want to be those. We want to be those who stand before him in righteousness, sinless, perfect. How? Only because of the grace of God. But while you're alive, you have the privilege to cooperate with him or fight against him. And fighting against him doesn't look bad. It makes sense. It's just getting yours. That's all. That's what it looks like. It looks like getting yours. It looks like fair. It looks like it's only fair. Yeah. Any idea where I stopped? Six. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. Here he's talking about doing good works. Why is he saying it's not of works? Salvation is not of works. Sanctification is. Getting to heaven has nothing to do with your good works. Looking like you're a child of God does. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to not have to do any works at all, because by grace are you saved. No, now that you've been saved, it is by God that you're supposed to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth, isn't he? No. No. There's just, there's just more to this, this salvation thing than, than we usually think about. Here I gave my life to Jesus Christ. That's justification. Someday I'm going to die and I'm going to go to be with Christ. That's glorification. Everything in between is my sanctification. God, the Holy Spirit, is making sure that if, I'm, that if I truly was born again, if I truly was justified, I will eventually get into heaven holy, perfect, just, spotless how he does it but while I'm alive I get to decide whether I want to be on the tipping point of doing what God wants or doing what I want if we get to the place where more of the people in the church are doing what they want what does a healthy church look like are there going to be sinners in the church yeah are there going to be unbelievers in the church yeah are there going to be people who give sometimes and don't give sometimes and show up sometimes? Yes. But at the tipping point, guys, we need to, get, we need to pray that God will let us become more of us on the I want to do God's will than the people on the side that I'm going to do my will. They would never in a hundred years say that's what they were doing. Never. And so I've asked you guys to do two things that are really, really, really going to show whose side you want to be on. What are those? Come faithfully. Give generously because it shows a sensitivity and a respect and appreciation for God. It shows a respect and appreciation and sensitivity for the people of God. And it shows a respect and appreciation and sensitivity to those of us who are trying to lead. The Bible says when you obey those who have, have that responsibility over you, we can do it with joy uh, and not with a burden because it's not profitable for you, he says. I wish I'd have made that up because that's pretty good, but that's, that's what he says. So when you come faithfully and you give generously, it's not a magic thing that happens, but it, it, it kind of it, it kind of expresses our allegiance. Yeah. So you were selected by God, and He wants you to be in Him. You were selected by God; He wants you to be like Him. That's going to show in how you live. And you were selected by God, and He wants you to be with Him. Ephesians one verse eleven, and we're through in Him. We were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Well, what is it that He wants? What is He doing? Everything He's doing is in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, which is the deposit the guarantee, the earnest of your salvation, the Bible says. You will get in because he who is faithful promised it. If you were truly glorified, justified, you will be glorified. And what I'm saying is if you want to be on the healthy side of the tipping scale here, if you have been justified, God says you will be glorified. Yay! You get to cooperate with God in this process of being sanctified. But you choose. We choose. We choose. 
Which side do we want to live on? Well, let's see what he says, and then we give it a shot. We, we, we try really hard, but, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit is doing it in you. So you, you've got spiritual momentum. There's a, a spiritual methodology. God, the Holy Spirit, is doing it through you. He's doing it in you. He's doing it for you. Why would I fight him? Because I want to get mine. That's me. I don't know you. I'm bad. You know, pride is a big deal. I meant you. <laughs> pride is a big deal. The fear of man, huge, huge. That's a confession. That's a, you know, fear of man, pride. Uh, uh, God, I don't want to miss out. But usually God, I don't want to miss out is not God, I don't want to miss out. I submit. It's usually, you know, get yours. I'm not quite that ruthless and nasty, but it feels dirty when you see everybody else getting blessed and, and you just kind of... So it's not so much that I go after it as much as I just... You've never heard me say this, but uh, Satan can't stop you. But he can throw up enough doubt, discouragement, you get disillusioned, you get distracted, and then who decides to quit? You decide to quit. I decide to quit. That's not what happened the last time. That was a flat-out pity party. No, no, it, it wasn't. There was a little bit of that in there. But this church belongs to God. You belong to God. I belong to God. What we want more than anything else, more than anything else, we want to bring God glory. We want to make Him grin. We want to make Him happy. How do we do that? Make sure that you've been justified. Get saved. He said you would ultimately be glorified. In the meantime, cooperate with him to be sanctified. Change your life. Change your life. Change your life. To do what? To do whatever he says that he's doing in your life anyway. What do you lose? Wow, what do we lose? Yeah. God, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for being gracious and generous. Thank you for being so, so God in our lives. In spite of the fact that we don't deserve you, we didn't know you, you picked us. You picked us to be in you and to be like you and to be with you. And, and God, I'm grateful that, that you are the faithful one and you're the one who promised and it will come to pass. So God, between here and there, I, I want to make you happy with my decisions. But man, I'm messed up and I need you. And I need to be surrounded by people who love you. We need to be surrounded by people who love you and want to be more and more like you. God, help me be a good friend. Help me be a good pastor. Help me be a good encourager. God, use us together to, to, to become that, that healthy church you'd want us to be, that we might reach people for you and then help them become more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Good to see you.